And now we are going to move to our next presenter, Dr. Neil Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson is the Science and Engineering Technical Advisor in the Information Innovation Office for DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So, Dr. Johnson, I'll spotlight you. And Hello. the floor is yours. Would you like me to put your slides up now, sir? Um, you want me to drive them or you can drive them? I'll do them from here, sir. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's fine. Good afternoon, everyone. So some of these we'll, we'll go through um, a little quick because um, they're eye candy. So I'm also a former academic. I used to be the uh, associate director of the Center for Secure Information Systems at George Mason University. Uh, I have uh, many years, um, about uh, 20, in doing operational related uh, media analysis and forensics. After 9-11, I left academia to put my powers to fight evil. Uh, been doing that ever since. And I uh, still uh, have my hands and feet in, uh, in academia. I, I, I'm an adjunct. I taught uh, 13 years media forensics at George Washington University. I teach cryptography now at George Mason University. And I'm also a lecturer on an ICDOD wide um, uh, forensic media analysis uh, course. Okay, so I'm actually going to talk about uh, a little bit about two programs that have been going on at DARPA. One is ending. That's the media forensics program, and the uh, semantic forensics program is uh, kicking off, hopefully, in uh, August. We're still in uh, negotiating contracts with performers, so there's limited information I can tell you about that uh, as far as the performers and, and what they're going to be doing, but I can, can provide some of the background information for the program. Uh, next slide. So when we look at media, now media is anything pretty much that comes in. It's the, the physical media that data is stored on. It's the devices. It's the communication channels. Multimedia is the image, video, audio, text information that uh, is passed through these channels or stored in these channels. Now the media forensics program metaphor was focused on detecting manipulated or augmented uh, image and visual content only and trying to differentiate and identify whether uh, it has been uh, modified yes or no. Not so much discussing about intent. We get into that with semantic forensics. This is an example of an image that would be provided to an analyst. You know, North Korea sent it out and it shows a, a landing craft exercise. And it's like, okay, they're having exercise. Great. Is there anything unusual about it? Is there any other intelligence we can gather from it? Well, there's a tremendous amount of information that comes along with this type of, of data. We may get sensor information, camera, uh, email addresses, tons of, of stuff coming out of the metadata. That's data about the data, but also about the content. And in scrutinizing this image, there's some anomalies that start to pop out and say, well, why did they do that? Or, or what's unusual? And next slide. If we take a look up close, there are some characteristics that defy the laws of physics. Um, there are no wakes. And there's duplicate pixels showing rooster tails behind a couple of landing craft that are identical, again, defying the laws of physics. We also have later information that provides some uh, showing six landing craft on a beach where the original image showing them in the water shows us eight. Why is that important? What is North Korea doing by modifying this image? Is, are they showing a greater capability or wanting to show them what they have? Why is eight versus six important? There's a lot of questions that come, come around this. Well, next slide. When we look at the types of manipulations that can occur and the amount of data that gets ingested or has to be handled, in receiving media either in pipes, on stream, or in captured uh, seized media and uh, drives and computers and, and that, there's hundreds of thousands, there's millions of media types, images, video in particular. And in fact, the number of tools that are used to augment or manipulate media um, far exceed the capabilities of detecting in the numbers. Uh, as a forensic analyst, I, I ran a DOD forensics lab for, for over 10 years, and sometimes when we, when we were getting started, it took a lot of effort and a lot of time to tease apart all this information. And we were looking at you know, 
probably dozens of images uh, at a time, one person would, a couple videos. But when we look at the growth of visual media content on the internet, it's been really exponential. Um, in 2018 was the last time I, I updated this chart. There were nearly three and a half billion visual media content items uploaded to social media each day. That's tremendous. And as an analyst, we just can't keep up for it. So the one reason that metaphor came into play uh, in about 2014, 15 was the, the concept of being uh, pitched to, to DARPA was around how to at scale mitigate this, this amount of data and provide indicators that would be useful for analysts and help them triage the information and get to answers or at least where they should focus on attention faster. Next slide. We want to dive into a little bit of the deep fake and synthetic media for a moment. Um, when Metaphor started, deep fakes didn't exist. Synthetic media was, was on in its embassy. We can see in the upper uh, left-hand corner, that was what a synthetically generated face looks like using a generative adversarial network. This is um, where we have a discriminator and generator. One's generating images based on what they're trained on and the discriminator says, is it real or is it not? And when the discriminator can no longer tell you whether it can differentiate between real and fake um, or real and synthetic, then it passes through the system. And we can see the progression of improvements through uh, 2018 and the upper, upper part where we're getting some photorealism in the images. Now, in the past year, year and a half, um, StyleGAN 2 has come out, which improves the, the perceptibility of these images or photorealism even better. And we'll see some examples of that. Uh, down below, with other types of manipulation, um, in the previous talk the, with the Jordan Peele driving um, Obama's face and features and saying something he didn't say is a puppet master type of approach. And that's the lower left where we have an actor um, making expressions and making statements and they're driving the ex expression and facial movements of a target video to make it seem like the person is saying something they didn't. Now this technology in this form does not change the voice. So the way, the reason the Obama video was somewhat compelling is that um, uh, the actor is a gifted impersonator and impersonates the mannerisms and speech patterns and tone of Obama and is able to make it seem like it is him. But we'll take a look at how successful it really was in light of new state-of-the-art detection techniques. In 2017, the uh, app Deepfake was created. It is a specific algorithm. Unfortunately, the term Deepfake is being hijacked. Um, everybody that's listening probably understands what it means when I ask you, do, you, do you know that if an image has been Photoshopped? Or what does it mean to Photoshop an image? Well, Photoshop is a piece of software. But it has come to be understood that when someone is manipulating an image, if they say they photoshopped it, we all understand that's what it means. The same is going true with the term deepfake. Deepfake is a specific algorithm that replaces the um, above the brow to below the mouth region of a face and does a face swap and then blends in. It does a pretty decent job, and that's why we can see Nicolas Cage in many, many movies he wasn't in. Um, however, Deepfake has now turned into um, more of anything that is generic or, or synthetically um, altered in some manner. I've even heard uh, people refer to some shallow fakes, uh, meaning more manual type of manipulations, as being deepfake just because it's, it's falsified information that is disseminating across the internet. The puppet master approach in manipulating faces also goes into an application algorithm called Everybody Dance Now, which was published in 2018, where now an actor can take control of a target's body, their entire motion. This was actually done, I believe, in, in uh, Brazil with one of the politicians showing them dribbling a, a soccer ball in uh, an office hall while responding to questions to the press. 
And then there is uh, different methods of the uh, voice synthesis, as well as augmenting what is being said in media based on changing transcript. And in 2019, some researchers um, worked on technique where modifying the typing in a different transcript would change what was being said in a video. And in this case, it was actually dropping the price of a Microsoft stock. And in the prior talk, um, talks, we heard about how some of this disruption can really cause a real effect in, a, in the economy transactions before they're caught and, uh, and recovered. Next slide. This is an example of a real person and the StyleGAN generated image. Now, this is a first generation StyleGAN, old 2018 technology. The new version is much more compelling. I will tell you that the boy is fake and the woman is real. There are some telltale signs that in StyleGAN 2 are starting to disappear, but algorithms can still pick up on it even when uh, humans begin to fail. Next slide. Uh, this gets into the kind of what I was talking about, where deep fake lies. Going from the um, left uh, to right, we're looking at different types of manipulation, everything from um, processing data to cover up tracks and anti-forensic techniques to the traditional cheaper fake of uh, Photoshop uh, capabilities or copy move or we'll, we'll in paint or we'll put in some different objects then into the synthetic and partially synthetic arena where a uh, machine learning and AI is really starting to take more and more of a role in modeling the environment and either producing completely new media or augmenting media that already exists to, to add objects, remove objects, and make it even more compelling. Those two columns tend to be what is all referred to as uh, deep fakes now, even though we're looking at a specific algorithm. Uh, next slide. So the process, I'm hoping this kicks off. It doesn't look like it is. Um, it's not really something that a person is going to uh, obtain videos and build really compelling fakes from scratch on their home computers in a reasonable amount of time. To make a really compelling image and video, it uh, takes a considerable amount of processing power as well as time on the order of days or even weeks. Some examples from Click um, a Shift Face online showing replacement of actors with their CGI models and, and improvements in, in providing that media from, from Hollywood takes days. It could take weeks. Uh, there's been a, a competition that's been open, uh, Red versus Blue Team by Lawrence Livermore for some performers on how well they can generate media versus the defense side of how well can they attack at increasingly or decreasingly amounts of time. And it gets to the point that if you're looking at within a day, the generators just aren't performing as well, even when throwing a number of GPUs or high-performing computers uh, toward the problem. Uh, next slide. The arrow probably should be going in the, in the other direction as far as, as skill and capability. This is a notional chart uh, we put together in looking at the types of of manipulations or augmentations that people may be familiar with or are hearing about and the amount of skill and resources required where the lower left hand corner near that near the axis is, is low skill uh, low resource now yes we can still take advantage of GANs people have uh, in going to this person does not exist dot com refresh a web page and you get samples of completely synthetic photorealistic faces, and we've seen those used in some um, dis disinformation um, events. And we have the shallow fakes. The shallow fakes takes a little bit of hands-on. We're probably copying, moving. The Pelosi video was, was mentioned. That was uh, adding frames uh, in a video to slow down the motion of a person. The pitch was raised in the audio to keep that consistent. So basically the video was slowed down and it made uh, uh, Pelosi seem like she was uh, a little bit incoherent and slurring her speech and just moving slow. The opposite happened with Jim Acosta video where frames were removed and it's 
artificially sped up a portion of the video to make it look like he was striking instead of just raising his hand. So the original videos are available for both for comparison, and these follow in the line of, of cheap fakes. Now, both of those have been referred to as deep fakes, but they're not. And then when we look at green screen and making a compelling green screen, you can see that this is not a really great one here. It's better than nothing, but to make a really good one takes a little more time, a little more skill, and a little more processing power, as does CGI. A lot of Hollywood work in, in face, age regression, progression has been relying on CGI. Uh, we've seen examples of where, of good and bad examples. The uh, Irishman, which was a, a movie released um, by Martin Scorsese, used CGI to progress and regress the age of the actors. And it was somewhat distracting because it wasn't that great. And online, some YouTube videos have popped up where people have taken the uh, segments of older movies from these same actors and use deep fake or face swapping technology where they're replacing the old actor's face with the young actor's model, same person, same uh, mannerisms and voice and things like that, but the younger face, much more compelling than what, what Hollywood has released. That took several weeks of effort to perform that. When you're looking at creating new algorithms, this is when you start to get into what's start as low resource groups. This would be at the university level, uh, master students, about $50,000 um, built a system that essentially recreated GPT-2 when OpenAI didn't release the model. Uh, the university was able to basically recreate it. And then we have nation states. This is U.S., uh, China, Russia, possibly Iran, and capabilities uh, uh, going up to the near peer. So this is really compelling, um, better fakes, harder for people to differentiate, as well as applying other techniques that will further confuse the analysts uh, in discerning what information should be pay, paid attention to or um, where have manipulations occurred. Next slide. So here's a couple other examples. This is one that is uh, machine learning AI generated. This is completely generating a scene. Now, I'm not manipulating someone. I'm creating a new event or new story. And with my Bob Ross-like professional skills, I was able to mock up the image on your left and just identify what I wanted this, the texture to resemble, whether it's mountains or sky or water, and click the button go in the middle, and it generates the image on the right. Now, what is interesting about this, you can go to it. It creates a fairly low, low resolution images. I'm talking about, not talking about a really photorealism, uh, but it does a pretty good job. And then a user can select the different styles on the bottom, and it will apply those styles to the structure you're painting. So this gives a lot of control to the end user. Some of the um, generation techniques for faces such as StyleGAN and StyleGAN2, these are basically uh, random number seeds that are fed into the generator and uh, images or faces are produced on the back end. Now, depending on where a researcher can insert themselves in the stream, they may be able to control the, the texture, age, hair, eyes, uh, position, uh, other face features, gender. Uh, um, but from the start to finish, if it's just the uh, vanilla system, you're starting up the generator and you're getting a variety of faces out. What this tool offers is complete control over the synthetic environment that is being produced. Next slide. Another method uh, where machine learning is making more progress is in the in-painting and object removal realm. Now, Photoshop has been doing this type of thing for years, uh, but not with machine learning. Uh, in the newer versions, they are starting to apply some of those algorithms. Uh, this is one that was developed by NVIDIA. Um, state of the art in the, in the GAN uh, hardware, as well as research in developing these photorealistic uh, uh, media. 
So here we have the original on the left, and I'm just highlighting, uh, painting over what I want to get rid of. And then the in painting tool by NVIDIA uses the rest of the image as a model to fill in these areas to um, remove objects I'm not interested in, in keeping. Next slide. So how do we detect that an augmentation or manipulation has occurred? Traditionally, uh, forensic tools available for doing this type of analysis um, rely on examining one item at a time. Uh, there's a lot of triage that goes in to, to segment out the types of media an analyst has to, to examine. And then one at a time, we're looking at these with a tool similar to this. This is one that was developed um, by the NVID project, is an EU project uh, for examining uh, manipulated media. We load the image into the interface, and a number of algorithms are, are processed, and we see mass for potential manipulations taking place. So depending on type of algorithm that we're looking at, there's different indicators. The far right gives us a heat map of, oh, there's maybe something going on with the hair. Um, the one on the far left says, okay, the whole thing looks like it has been compressed a couple times, so there's artifacts that, that reveal double JPEG compression. The one next to it says, oh, it's, it looks like there's, there's something going on with the eyes. This image, this entire image, is synthetic. This is a style GAN or maybe a program image. As an analyst, if I'm relying on the images across the bottom to provide indicators to me, I can say, yeah, it looks like there's something going on, but I'm chasing down rabbit holes in not understanding what the algorithms are doing and explaining what it's, is actually going on with this image. Next slide. And we've seen these type of manipulations, both synthetic and cheap fake. On the top image, we're looking at the uh, kind of photoshops with the MH17 shoot down. The Russians were claiming that the Ukrainians uh, aircraft shot down um, the, uh, the MH17 um, and provided this image as evidence. And some uh, independent researchers at Bellingcat pointed out that, yeah, things don't add up. Uh, the attacker craft is inconsistent with what um, Russians were claiming. The fact that Jumbo Jet isn't the same model as MH17, and they were able to find this same background in a Google Earth um, search of, the, of that region. So this was a composite of several images that the um, allegedly the Russians put together and were initially being touted as, oh, here's, here's evidence that you know, we, didn't, we didn't cause this problem. In the Catalan independence uh, movement, there are a number of images that were showing online. It, it, it was a rallying cry for independence, a lot of emotion around that. And some images were real and some of them were less so. What we're seeing on the screen in the upper right is, yeah, it's a protest. There's a clash with police. That clash happened. What didn't happen was the presence of that flag. That flag was photoshopped into that scene as a way to elicit a response, an emotional response, and get people saying, you know, this is, this is important, this is part of the passion that's going on. But this event, as that occurred, didn't happen. When I teach forensics, I explain to my students, I said, when you're, you're going to manipulate data, you're going to augment it to improve the intelligibility, do what you can to avoid introducing additional information or changing the story. And we're talking about what's happening between these images and, and the manipulation from what is the story, what is the event as it occurred in the sensor versus how is it being represented to the public or social media or across the news, and is there something that is changing that story, changing the dynamic, changing the meaning? If so, why? Sometimes we care, sometimes we don't. I'll talk about that a little bit later. In the lower images, we can see the, the automated or, or semi-automated techniques. Already seen examples of the Jordan Peele uh, Obama video, and then there's also the Katie Jones. Katie Jones is an interesting one. It was a, a honeypot LinkedIn page that was established to uh, find out what kind of responses and links uh, could be provided. The Katie Jones face is from um, 
a style GAN generator. That person does not exist. The profile is not of a real person. And the KJS profile got invitations to speak at conferences, um, got links to about 50 different um, individuals, some high-level um, Intel and DOD folks before it was shut down. Who did it? I'm not exactly sure. But it was an interesting case, and in, this is a fake persona that was developed for LinkedIn as a, as a way to bait people that may be interested in the Russian Eurasia studies around the Center for Strategic and uh, International Studies. Next slide. So on the media forensics program, there's several different ways of examining media through using machine learning techniques that were applied over the past four years. We're looking at digital integrity. This is can we trust the bits and, and pixels that are being shown on the screen? Um, what's going on? And here's an example of, of looking at the duplication of the pixels with the rooster tails. Then is what we're observing consistent with physics? Do the laws of physics apply? And then there's semantic integrity. Semantic gets into the meaning of what is being shown and the construct and content of what is shown relative to other information we may learn about it. Weather conditions, shadow. Are the shadows consistent with the time and day of this reporting? We have a date and time stamp we can pull out, off of this of, of, from the media, from time it was uploaded to time it was received. What's that time series look like? How fast is it propagating? Where are the source information? All that gets into the semantics. And then these measurements are fused to come up with an integrity reasoning score across the digital, physical, and semantic domains. And a reason for coming up with that score is it gives us an indicator that can be indexed and searched and filtered on. It's a great way of providing triage of a tremendous amount of, of data to narrow down what we need to pay attention to. Now, is it important if it says we have high integrity and we can trust this media because it looks like it, it came off a camera? Absolutely, because we have camera data, we may have software information, there's a lot of, of wealth of information that, that can be gleaned from data that comes out of software and sensors. If it's been manipulated, is that important to us? Well, yes, because the tools and techniques we would use to chase down sensor information or other metadata, some of that information we or process we wouldn't even apply if it's been augmented. If I'm analyzing video and I get one that has the YouTube or Google tags in it, there's a whole lot of stuff I'm not going to do because it didn't come off the camera and that data didn't, wasn't preserved. Uh, next slide. So, the Metaphor program ran for about four years. Uh, we ran yearly evaluations um, across uh, probably 100 different, we have over 100 different analytics that are, are running um, and have been evaluated. And what these charts get to is uh, each one of the gray lines in the lower left are performance measurements. We're looking at rock curves, receiver operator characteristics, the trade off between true positive and on the uh, y axis and false positive rates on the on the x-axis, and uh, a near-perfect example is the image on the right, where we have um, nearly zero uh, false alarm rates with uh, a true positive rates for, um, for many. The left image shows the red line is a fusion score. So this is where we have a number of analytics that are returning scores on a type of manipulation. Some are high, some are low. Negative is also important and provides more information. What the FUSE score offers is a wrap-up or roll-up of the contributing or what's important features are being flagged upon and presenting that in a way to come up with a single integrity score for a media type given a number of manipulations that are being detected. Next slide. So some of the research that has happened since deep fakes have come out so about halfway through the program is when deepfakes showed up and then we were asked, you know, we understand that metaphor is designed for more traditional forensics, uh, looking for uh, image and video manipulations. Can this also apply to, to deepfakes as they're are gaining speed and, and a lot of interest? And the answer is yes. 
um, there are some characteristics and artifacts that are introduced by these systems that um, are quite detectable. Uh, the, the chart on the bottom right makes me very happy. This is a rock curve on log scale. What does that mean? That means the value, the detection accuracy is so close to zero. We look at it on a log scale to, to differentiate between the algorithms. Otherwise, they would all look like they're nearly a perfect detector. Um, we have a classification accuracy on those of over 99%. The uh, image on the lower left is comparing um, real versus fake Obama video, the fake one being the Jordan Peele. Now, this is a, turned into a protection, um, personal protection models that are being used and modeled um, for all the, at the time, all the candidates that uh, were in the potential running for U.S. presidency during this cycle. So there are models being built for, for Trump, for Biden, um, it was for all the other all the other candidates as well as some others that are that are higher up in the um, uh, chain of command that um, models are also being built on, and this is in a concert with the UC Berkeley and uh, Kitware. Kitware is a prime on Metaphor, and everybody has a tell, and what they're learning are the tells, and that even with a per impersonator as gifted as Jordan Peele, he doesn't have the tells that Obama has. And we can differentiate a video that he impersonates as well as one that um, was real at, from Obama. And we're doing the same thing um, for other candidates uh, to include the president uh, for this upcoming election. Uh, next slide. So that kind of the nutshell of what goes into our system. Media goes in, we look at different types of integrity reasons and build a fusion and then the, a score of how much can we trust this as being authentic um, or has it been manipulated to a point that, that you know, we need to understand why if it's important to us, that we have less trust into the data. Uh, next slide. That just gets in, into the fusion and, and the goal is just to, to um, trigger on the, or identify the, the weights of the scores and provide a single score. Uh, next slide. We'll go ahead and Move that. That's just more of the fusion scores and the impact. Next slide. This is an example of an interface of, a, of a, the prototype system, metaphor prototype system, where we load in an image, and as it's being uploaded, the gallery fires, uh, or the, the uh, analytics fire. And we see a list of analytics on the right-hand side. Each one of these boxes represents a type of analytic. Uh, these are all Dockerized containers. This is a modular system. Each of the analytics can be pulled out with, and accessed uh, with API across a number of systems. In fact, we're having a demo day on August 11th. Uh, it's going to be virtual. Uh, DARPA is a sponsored demo day for Metaphor. And there's going to be multiple systems of, that different agencies are using that are taking these types of analytics and plugging them in to augment the analysis that they are providing. And what we see in this example is a gallery on the, on the left loading in the Catalan uh, image. And the percent scores that we see uh, on the thumbnails are the um, integrity scores. These are the fused scores um, based on the, this, I believe, used the boosted uh, fusion model. And we get the score, which is, is low in this case, uh, to put my cheaters on to see what that is. It's about, this is zero. Okay, very low. Um, which means we have we have low trust in this being an authentic or, or uh, unmodified uh, image, and then we also have uh, analytics that show these show their scores or masks. And what we're viewing on the screen in the middle is a mask overlay with hot spots of where uh, significant manipulation may have occurred. Uh, the analytics on the on the right um, identify which analytics are being triggered. Uh, as well as the fused results at the top. The ground truth one is, is for our own internal research. NIST provided um, challenge problems, and there's a lot of data with these challenge problems. So NIST would identify what the ground truth is and where the manipulations occurred and provide those masks. So if this was an image that was used in, in the NIST evaluation, we would be able to load it and compare how well the analytics are performing as compared to the ground truth mess that that would show. Uh, that's just, that's not something that would be available um, necessarily uh, that, that people would be interested in because they're 
for the most part, you don't have the ground truth when you're in a forensic shop uh, processing data. Next slide. Um, let's cycle this until they, they show up. So challenges, um, oh, go back. What happened to the bullets? There we go. So there's some challenges were popping up. Um, I, I started at DARPA in uh, November 2018, halfway through the program. And uh, there was a lot of challenges around, well, we expect most data on the Internet is going to be compressed multiple times. We see that, we know that. Uh, there's also anti-forensic techniques that are being applied as, as well as adversarial inputs. Some of those were discussed a little bit earlier where noise patterns can be introduced to, to uh, incorrectly uh, classify and identify media. So we started introducing these as augmentation techniques and manipulations to media to find out how well the analytics that are being developed uh, perform. Still room for growth, still room for... Um, for understanding the impact for some of these. Um, also reasoning across multiple assets and modalities. Metaphor really was around image and video only. Audio came into play when it, it tied to uh, consistency with what is being shown in the image, either through speech or uh, environmentals. And then there's characterization. If somebody took out a, a beach ball or a person on their beach picture um, to, to make a, a, a prettier or better uh, vacation photo? Do we really care? Probably not. Um, when they start to remove, um, you know, politicians or insert weapons or um, try to mask the school buses as tanks and vice versa, we care. So we need to get into this characterization of intent and malice versus Am I just doing a white balance to make my image better looking to me? That's not so much interesting as it is some of the others. And then really getting into to threat models that um, and use cases that transition partners and the communities that would be using these type of tools care about. And next slide. So that brings us toward um, semantic forensics. I know about have a few minutes left, right? So semantic forensics gets into all the modalities, and this is where one, uh, the program is going to be kicking out, off in August. Uh, next slide. And what we're looking at is detection. I've already talked to you all about detection on the image and video side. This is detecting image, video, audio, text, the associated distribution and presentation of media. Attribution is the manipulation or source of media consistent with who they claim to be, or can we attribute them to known actors? And then the characterization is uh, the intent, malice or not, across multimedia to defend against large-scale disinformation attacks. Next slide. Now, the techniques across modalities are getting better and broadening. Uh, we see a combination of text and images. We have a, a false ad down in the bottom. That it, those bedrooms don't exist. They were all synthetically generated. However, what we are observing are, are semantic inconsistencies in the way that media is being generated. Next slide. Let's see if these pop up. Okay. What we have in the text was um, carpeting, 24-7 carpeting and bathroom with seating for two more people. There's some words and phrases that just fall out and, and, and are semantically incorrect. It is a school bus being classified as a tank or a tank being classified as a school bus are semantic inconsistencies. These, to me, point to failures in the machine learning and AI approach and because to the human eye, we can still differentiate and determine what these objects are, but the machine learning algorithms are mistaken. There's a level of semantics that's missing, and this is where we're going to get into with the semantic forensic program and using some of those features and, and diving in further. It's beyond faces. It's images, it's all kinds of images, uh, cats if you like, vehicles, buildings, We've seen fake resumes, GPT-2 and GPT-3 uh, have some really compelling um, generated media. GPT-3 was used to, to create uh, um, synthetically generated uh, dad jokes. 
because dad jokes. Uh, next slide. And what we're looking at is is where these different modalities can can play. We've already seen the targeted personal attacks with the some of the deep fakes. There's generated stories or augmented stories um, that are inconsistent with what is being captured. And then there's the random fake, which is pulling together ransomware and deep fake or augmented data. Now, most of you on the call are probably familiar with the uh, a security background checks and that kind of information. What if we can augment that information and make it look like you're saying something you shouldn't be saying, acting in a way you shouldn't be acting, and providing a reporting evidence that puts you in an environment that you weren't in? And if you don't pay them a ransom, then they're going to ruin your credibility or probably interfere with your uh, investigation process. Next slide. Um, let's go ahead and next slide. Next slide. So what we're going with notionally uh, in the semantic forensics is looking at uh, across modalities. We have text, image, audio, video. Consider this as type, kind of like a news feed or, or source. And the presentation, it, it, it attributes to a, a news organization, an author, and says it's a rainy day, a violent group of protesters gather in front of the U.S. Capitol building protesting Social Security. Well, there's some consistencies that we can pull together. So if we go to the next slide, we hear that there's a group. We can see there's a group. We can hear child cheering. We can see that it looks to be a protest. Okay, that checks out. But there's inconsistencies that are they're semantically relevant. Next slide. And this is where we look in. There doesn't appear to be violence. There are kids present. There are people hugging in scenes. The signs are holding up uh, information about equality, uh, one on health. It's not related to Social Security. What happened? Why is, this ha why is this presented in this matter? Next slide. As in the Catalonian uh, example, it is probably to uh, elicit a response to a targeted audience. So diversity, or I'm sorry, <laughs> so um, discordance between groups and further polarize them. Uh, we've seen that in, in ads, we've seen it in tweets, and so it's a way of how do we help people uh, understand and whether they can trust media and provide information. We're not trying to, regardless of what Rolling Stone magazine has said about DARPA, we're not trying to censor the internet. What we are trying to do is provide meaningful indicators so that consumers can say, hey, there's a red flag to this. Maybe I should check the source. Maybe I should see something else as to this event taking place. We've seen Twitter and Facebook already going down this path and raising red flags and saying, this may not be correct. You may want to check your source information on that. Some of the algorithms that are developed through, through social media sites are using researchers that we have funded on, on DARPA to provide this. Next slide. Is this malicious? It's certainly an augmentation, a manipulation. Do we care? Probably not. It's interesting and entertaining. Next slide. What about this one? Here, the story is being changed and is politically charged. Neither of these two images could be derived from the other. They both have a common ancestor. That's the provenance and pedigree. But one, the Junk Education Act of 1982 is more original. That's what the text that was on the signs, and we support ROTC was a uh, manipulated one that was uh, posted on the internet. Next slide. This kind of gets into the the different technical areas that we we have on the program to include in the bottom right a red team, and this is going to be state of the art, a uh, staying up with state of the art. I mean, deep fakes was kind of a surprise um, on the DARPA program part way through we're not going to be surprised again. And we actually have the, the challenge curation and red team side is going to be uh, researchers in, in state of the art, as well as following what's coming out uh, internationally in these areas and curate, uh, help curate challenges as well as feed to the evaluation data uh, and use case and threat modeling um, for the program. Next slide. 
So that kind of summarizes the, the programs of where we're going, where we are, where we're going, uh, kind of four years plus in a, in a nutshell, uh, a few minutes going over. These are just some, some questions on, on what we need to con continue to consider and, and, and some of what we're addressing in the uh, upcoming program. Next. Okay. Not sure if you have any questions. Um, I did not have the chat up because I, I didn't want to get distracted while trying to uh, drive through these. So Dr. Johnson, I don't want to let anybody get away without answering at least one question. So we'll, sure. we'll make up the time. We'll, we'll, we'll kill that break later on. Um, so here's, here's one from Alec. Um, they, want, they want your opinion on whether or not it makes sense to create and distribute tools like these for the public. Do you think these tools can be made user-friendly enough to enable people who don't have a background in forensics to use them? Absolutely. Um, within reason. There is not a single agency um, that can take on this problem. Uh, I really do see news outlets and social media as being the front line um, that comes into the end consumer. Uh, that, that's the, that's, you know, where the data is coming in. That's the, that's the attack vector. Um, I would love to see tools like this in every social media, um, every news agency, um, defense, forensic shops. There's different levels of expertise and different levels of the analytics that make sense. I'm not going to hand over forensic tools to my mom. But what I do want my mom, what I do, do want her to understand is getting from a news source or a social media feed that if there's an indicator that says, this may not be completely true. Um, here's a link to a fact check or here's uh, some additional information. It gets into the, uh, somebody mentioned the, the uh, true sandwich, I think, in chat earlier. I, I love that, where disinformation and misinformation is going to happen. We've been living with it forever. As long as people com can communicate, going back to, to Cain and Abel, there's, you know, I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's disinformation and misinformation. It's going to happen. But what we need is our indicators that can help us have trust or at least some kind of indicators. We're living with spam all the time in email. Why not have something like a, a, a spam filter, at least an indicator? I'm still getting in my inbox. I have a choice that I can dump all spam tag in my spam box or look at it all. But it's an indicator and gives me some control over what I'm going to ingest and how I pay attention to it. I love that my cell phone provider says, possible spam when I get the email. I'll let it roll the voicemail. And I think most of the time it is, it is spam. I'm okay with that. And I would like the same type of um, checks happening and at least indicators with media as it is being consumed and disseminated. Um, I, I, I think that, that uh, having this in the, in the public and out is, is a good thing. Well, Dr. Johnson, thank you for that comment, that answer. And thanks for kicking off the second half of the conference here when we start talking about solutions to it. You're now, you are now an official Army Mad Scientist, so we thank you for coming on and talking to us. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.